Good evening to all our back chatters at home. Today's back chat is a rather interesting one. I go by the name of Ulwazlo Apesheya, Wawa Koza Isbongo, and right next to me. Umkundis Wakumed. Thank you to everyone who has logged on from home and welcome once more to our phenomenal back chat session. So, to give you a slight background on what it is that today's sessions aim, or what it is that these sessions aim to achieve, back chat is a conversation. Um, a very honest conversation, a very robust conversation, but a conversation where we differ with respect. So, in all your addresses, please do maintain some level of decorum. I have attended a few back chat sessions where the conversation got really heated, that people left the room in a bit of a disarray. So, as we argue, as we engage, I'd like to highlight that it is a constructive conversation at the end of the day, and we should all partake and join in it, fruitfully so. I will begin by acknowledging the Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, and thank you once more for creating a platform where young people get to engage with various spheres of government in all their tiers. So I'll just um, open up today's session by asking Deputy Minister Budima Namela to give us all a warm welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luazi. And let me firstly extend uh, greetings to uh, all our uh, panelists who have agreed to join us here today. Um, uh, we have a whole range of uh, panelists today. Of course, today we are not congregated in one area as panelists, so we'll just have to uh, do with. Uh, what we have in terms of the COVID uh, regulations, and hopefully our next back chat will be uh, convened under different circumstances. Uh, but otherwise, I'd really like to welcome all the panelists who are here, some of the colleagues. We've got uh, one of our uh, deputy minister here. We've got uh, one of the, uh, the former statisticians here. We also have the CEO of uh, uh, Tim Geek, uh, who, who uh, has also joined us. Uh, we have the ANC Youth League uh, National Youth Task Team uh, convener, who's part of the uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Sandy Lezungu is also here, um, who's the uh, president of uh, uh, Black Business Council and the CEO of uh, the National Youth Development Agency. Uh, so I hope I've acknowledged everyone. Oh, and Mr. Rudy Dix, uh, who's uh, in the, uh, but in particular, our Minister Nomalugelo Noma Kina, who uh, I, I am, well, I'm quite confident that, uh, uh, you know, together with the entire panel uh, would be helpful, I mean, will be helpful in helping us explore the key issues around unemployment, in particular youth unemployment. And I hope that our focus today would not necessarily be on what the problem is, uh, but also go deeper into focusing on what kind of solutions are we looking at in order for us to deal with the challenge of youth unemployment in our country. I just want to highlight some few points before we uh, you know, get to invite through the uh, facilitators our, uh, um, uh, I mean, our, our panelists. We are finding ourselves as a country uh, in one of the most crucial uh, periods. It is, it has been 27 years or so since uh, uh, national uh, general elections um, and all those uh, activities that have been happening. It could be in terms of uh, policy, it could be in terms of legislation, and a whole range of uh, sets of interventions that have been made since the dawn of our democracy. The intention has been to better the lives of uh, millions of South Africans, particularly young people uh, who, uh, uh, you know, holds uh, on their shoulder the future of this country. Uh, and we found ourselves in the last few weeks in a situation or moment where in, uh, you know, uh, uh, young people joined in, uh, in uh, what was uncharacteristic of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, 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 protests in our country where destruction of property happened, where there was uh, vandalization of uh, shops, looting of uh, goods, burning of uh, uh, trucks and all of that. And we hope that that on its own is in the past. Of course, a whole range of messages have come out from government in terms of how this is being characterized. But of importance is the fact that as long as we have more and more young people who are unemployed, who are not in education or in, in any form of uh, training institution, or are not participating in any uh, form of uh, 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 entrepreneurial initiative, we are going to or may actually have more of these uh, type of uh, violent uh, uh, protest occurring. And therefore, this is actually a very agent, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, discussion. Many uh, people have said, uh, you know, this could yet be, uh, you know, another talk show. But I believe that through the sharing of ideas on what we have, what is working, what is not working, but also from listening to young people themselves, we're able to be enlightened in terms of the kind of agent interventions that needs to be made in order for us to be dragged away from the kind of abyss that we were almost facing uh, in the last week or two. The, pan the, the COVID uh, pandemic has also not made any uh, of the situations that we find ourselves uh, better. We are uh, essentially uh, you know, finding ourselves in a situation where in structural unemployment has, uh, uh, you know, worsened. Uh, the economy has uh, uh, slowed down uh, in terms of economic growth. Uh, you know, uh, even then, in instances where we had higher growth uh, in the economy, we've also not uh, experienced a situation where in the economy was yielding jobs. And therefore, we have to be asking ourselves very pertinent but also very hard questions. And I hope that part of today's session would help in not only uh, you know, reopening the doors on what the challenge is, but also help us navigate through the kind of solutions that needs, uh, I mean, that our country uh, is needed. One of the things which we've asked the services CETA to do uh, as part of this uh, uh, you know, uh, back chat is for them to help us to sift through some of the uh, proposals and suggestions that comes out of here and, uh, you know, help us to explore and lobby and campaign some of those, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, in government. But what is clear also is that it's not only government that needs to be doing something. We need to see uh, people in the civil society. We need to see government agencies such as the National Youth Development Agency. We need to be seeing uh, business and business leadership also coming out and making a contribution in helping us to, uh, you know, get out of the rut of unemployment that we've been finding ourselves. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, joining us. And I hope that, as usual, this will be one of those exciting uh, engagements. I must, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, send a caution to those who it is their uh, first engagement with us uh, 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 you know, in back chat, is that this is no holds barred uh, engagement. There's no deputy minister, there's no elderly, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 party. If you uh, are going to be using your white beard as authority, the young people, uh, you know, uh, uh, are quite engaging and quite robust. So I hope that we take that, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, I mean, with the honesty with the frankness that it comes with, but also that it's also informed by the kind of frustrations that young people are finding themselves in. I'm hoping that from here onwards, all of us who are part of this panel will become advocate of whatever jewels of proposals that uh, you know emanates from here and ensure that we make all of those work. And that's the only way in which we can make South Africa work. Thank you very much, uh, facilitators. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, Deputy Minister. Um, I'd just like to go back to the topic, right? Today's back chat topic is youth skills and unemployment. In a time where we saw what happened 
two weeks ago take place when we all stood up and were taken aback grossly by the activities, both by young and old. I think what has happened in the recent past has been a great highlight of where we find ourselves and how it is that people are so disenfranchised and so excluded from the mainstream economy and even from any other form of economic activity that exists outside of the mainstream. So this conversation comes at a very critical time in South Africa. It comes at a time where South Africa is at a brink of need. We are constantly at a, at a dire need for rebuilding and constructive conversations. And to join in this conversation, and I'll hand over to Mkondisi to highlight how it is that you can engage with us on social media platforms. As my co-facilitator co has highlighted, this type of engagement really works when we have your input. So we encourage you to join the conversation. Um, you can direct your robust engagement that the Deputy Minister is expecting and has welcomed and has encouraged you to send our way by doing it on the Teams chat in this particular webinar. There are people joining us via YouTube who can use the comments section there. And we'll also be monitoring Facebook um, on um, the Deputy Minister's Facebook page, Putimanamela. It's in those places where we'll be reading your engagements, your inputs, your comments. And what we'll do is that before the session is over, there's an allotted amount of time where we'll put those questions, your views and your voice to the expert panel that we have before us. But I think to set the stage, I want to hand, hand back to Luazi, who will introduce our um, context setting speaker. Thank you, Mkondisi. Um, so before I introduce the panel, I'll introduce a very phenomenal man, the former statistician general, Dr. Badi Lehotla, who's going to give us the facts and figures, right? Because I think that it is important that we speak on numbers. It is important that we speak on knowledge that is pre presented, uh, presented to us and that we do not speak solely on fiction and our own imagination. So yes, the realities on the ground exist and we are aware of them, but what do the numbers look like? How bad is our situation? Or how good is our situation, right? So without wasting any further time, I'm going to ask for Dr. Bari Bukhutla to please join us and give us the facts and figures. I saw the deputy minister is dressed like a youth in hairstyle. Uh, I thought I would have the same kind of hairstyle, but uh, uh, it's very expensive to try and uh, keep uh, to a particular hair uh, culture. It's a very expensive uh, uh, task, that one. So I prefer that uh, maybe I should just show my bold. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I titled my topic very provocatively uh, to talk about foresight tools for policy coherence. A, a ritual for lamentation, because I think over the years we have just lamented and have not done anything. And I think uh, this conversation uh, should not be one of those lamentations. Uh, let's see what we can put shoulder to heel to get uh, through this. I'm quoting here uh, uh, Minister Nzimande, uh, where he said, what is needed is knowledge and planning instruments for the system and research-based intelligence for strategic decision-making. He made this statement 11 years ago. Unfortunately, I have not seen any knowledge and planning instruments for the system and research-based intelligence. And I'll show you the facts around this. And indeed, he's correct in saying that that's what we need. But even in the presence of that, there hasn't been any action to deal with these facts as they are through a research-based intelligence for strategic decision-making. And I would argue that the events of last week were a culmination of the absence, utter absence of this kind of approach to our life. Now, here, we ran aside and looked at uh, what South Africans think are the most crucial things. And they said, oh, access to reliable and safe water, lack of uh, employment opportunities and cost of electricity. The darker, the more prevalent were these priorities by area. Now, if our priorities are these, uh, don't expect politicians to talk to us differently. They'll say promise us water and uh, employment and cost of electricity reduced. Now, when it came to the subject of today, 
which is education. It was priority number 15. So we deserve the ministers and deputy ministers that we have because we have said that's our priority. So if uh, we don't change our language and change these priorities, we are going to have a serious problem. And I would argue that, uh, uh, and I'll come to this. And of course, uh, here is a man who had great vision around his race, the route. In 1953, on the 25th of September, he stood in parliament and said, what is the use of teaching a band to child mathematics when it can't, it cannot use it in practice? And from then on, it's all history. That's 53, and we have 70 years on, and we still don't teach mathematics. Instead, we are talking about math literacy. 1976, riots were about education, which we are saying is priority number 15, well beyond water and all the other things. The fifth mass fall, 40 years later, from 1976, was a repeat of the same thing. And this thing was not different from the 60s uh, of the movement of, on education by our former president, Tabombeg. He was there. And then Steve Biko, well before 76. But the issues were about education. And 40 years later, fees must fall. And this fees must fall was about fees must fall not for a white race or a black race, but for everyone. And then what did their government do? They decided to go and say for the poor, once you define them as poor, they'll remain poor. Instead of saying fees must fall for everyone, because the national duty is to bring these races together. And it is only at university where we have the critical numbers that have to be there for four years, three years. But when you are black, you may be there for seven years, by the way. Where you have a critical number of young people to determine the future of this country by not allowing that to happen and nitpicking and saying for the poor, for the rich, is not going to work. I know that I have seven minutes, I'll not spend time on this. Here, we are looking at uh, children that are born in South Africa by year from 2002. It's almost a million children a year, 1.2 by 2016. And of course, the ones who pass who write metric and those who uh, try to pass metric by some level is 400. There are 700, 800,000 children that uh, don't see the future. In fact, amongst those that actually pass metric, only 150,000 per cohort of born 1.2 million will see an, a reasonable exemption. By the way, let's remember that education, basic education, which is from grade one or grade not or R to metric, is a constitutional right. So, by not making 900,000 children pass with a credible pass, we are not meeting that constitutional right. So the constitutional right of appearance before the law as equals, it's equally demanded for by children who must be able to enjoy the same constitutional right of education. Now, of course, we can look at this. I mean, this is uh, how different races performed, uh, having completed grade seven after uh, completing uh, grade zero. Uh, Persons who completed grade seven after they completed grade three. I mean, whites were already as far back as 1950, but blacks were still in the Teterwani area. Kalizu and Katupeng, they hadn't moved as much. But towards uh, 1990, uh, Black said. But when it comes to uh, progression at uh, grade nine, uh, much lower. And then when it comes to uh, 20, grade, grade, grade 10, uh, even much lower, the colors and the Blacks remain there, the, the Indians and whites up there. Now, here, we are looking at what is happening. Uh, this side, we are measuring who are doing well, uh, percentage-wise. And here, we are having white, Indian, colored, and Black. And this side, we are looking at time. And this, we are looking at people who are completing degrees after they have completed a grade standard. Dad, look at this. When it does this, it means you are not performing. And it, 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 the blacks are, and colors are not performing. Uh, the whites have always been performing very well, and the, the Indians the same. So even at this point in time, this situation, and hence you see fees must fall. And now, if you look at this graph, it is showing us the proportion by race, this side is the proportion of whites, 
and this side the proportion of blacks as cause we could do it for indians and colors but uh, as an illustration here you see the proportion of whites with degrees the bag is pregnant uh, this one is very emaciated so south africa is leaning on a very weak uh, 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 structure of few whites but as a proportion it will look like korea where 45 percent of the population has degrees and here amongst blacks it says four less than three percent the rest is abet here yeah. abet 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 and here yeah, it's a primary and so on and so on. so until we have become as pregnant as whites this side that are going to move of course it has a, a structure implications and of course in absolute numbers the difference is not that big but let's remember whites are few and then the blacks are few. We have only 2 million graduates in the country. If we can do this 60 million and it requires to be a developmental state. You cannot be a developmental state with this kind of numbers. And this is continuing. It's not getting better. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, just uh, to, 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 to show you what happens by population group. Uh, these guys who actually talk vendor uh, do much better. Uh, uh, I mean, they're almost... Uh, 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 close to those who are in Africans. And here in the Africans, uh, there is a colored uh, point here. Uh, if you remove the colored, the Africaners will almost be close to the English, and the Sivendas will be there. And this Sivenda thing is about uh, the flexibility of the language, which reaches uh, to the Shona languages and the Bantu languages and all other languages. And uh, uh, that you see in the index of integration amongst the Venda people. Now, here are the kinds of implications in terms of the labor market. In 1994, uh, by race and uh, by age group, uh, the proportion of those who were managers in the in the in the, in, in work. Uh, this is white. This is Indian. This is colored. This is black. So you can see fewer blacks proportionately were in management jobs. Colors uh, bigger in Indian. And this is 1994. Now we move forward to 2016. Uh, look at that. And look at blacks for the group 25 to 34. Uh, they actually reduced. Uh, I had a major uh, problem here with uh, Minister Manta. She was chair of the ALC at the time, Secretary General, and Minister Blade, when I presented these results, said it can be true. I said, well, it's not me saying so, it's the figures that I collected. Um, so I had a, a, a lot of uh, uh, problems with them there. But you can see that the 25 to 34 have actually reduced their share from where it was at about uh, 18%, and it reduced to about 14% by 25 to 34. The ones who were here uh, have remained the same. Now, if you are a young person who is age 15 to 24, in 2008, two million of you will have been employed. See here, this is employment this side, and this is unemployment this side. Two million of you will have been employed as a young person of 15 to 24. Here, five and the, almost 5.7 million of you will have been employed in 2008. Fast forward to 2021, uh, the statistician general, Risenga Maluleke, is measuring like I did. Uh, after all, we did the work together. 500,000 less 25 to 34 year olds are now employed. Uh, one million less, only one million of 15 to 24 are employed. Now, if you look at the future in South Africa and you have this pyramid before you, what future do you think can be there? There isn't. Because the cat, mother cat, has started eating the kittens. That's the reality of this country. And it's intolerable, completely intolerable. Look at how the unemployment has grown this side. Between 2008 and at the most, we should have kept this share in absolute terms constant. But we are eating up our children. Now, we know that unemployment is the biggest driver of poverty. Here, 33% grew to 40% by in 10 years. But in five years, the difference was twice the speed. This thing is accelerating. So what we saw will happen again if we don't actually change the situation. Here you add those who are years of schooling. Uh, years of schooling increased, therefore, as the drive of poverty reduced. But when you add 11 plus 52, you are 63%. And poor, poor, 
because 63% of our poverty is defined by this. Of course, the politicians want to give you water, want to give you a type of dwelling, things that do not impact on poverty significantly. Because when you uh, get people employed, they'll solve these things themselves. Now, this is worse for the people who are 15 to 24. Theirs is education attainment, it drives their poverty 35% contribution and adult unemployment and this. So when you add this to 70% of the young people's future is impacted, uh, poverty status is impacted by education attainment other than and not in employment and in education. If these statistics don't talk to us for as many years I've presented these results, then we are not cooking like frogs. We are two already. So the work as early as 14, uh, 10 years ago, Azda Dalzade worked on a tool for strategic decision making and skills planning. And he was answering the question that Minister Zimande uh, uh, asked. The presentation and the data are there at higher education, and nothing has been done about it. That's the reality we face. How do we solve this problem of inaction right round? Other accountability is not anything, I don't know what I can call it. That absence of passion, that absence of compassion, that absence of responsibility cuts across the government. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, former Statistician General. Um, after your presentation just now, I feel very sorry for the policymakers in the room or the virtual room because they are the ones who have to answer to that. And they are the ones who have to feel the wrath of both you and our young people in the room. So I would like to caution them and wish them well as the conversation continues. Without wasting any further time. Uh, my apologies, I'll step out now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll escape uh, the kinds of uh, missiles that have come to me, that <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We're acknowledging the hit and run. Have a good evening, Dr. <laughs> I think you have left us with, with some shocking figures that have raised the hairs at the back of a lot of our necks. Um, but without wasting any further time to dissect the facts and figures, that have been presented by the former statistician general. Um, I will present my panel. However, due to the magnitude of the panel that we have today, I will. I know very well that a small girl from Singh, I cannot do justice to the profiles that are before me. So I will hand over to um, the, the, the different speakers that we have to introduce themselves. Um, and we have Deputy Minister Buti Manamela. We have the Deputy Minister of the Department of Trade and Industry, um, DM Nomalunge Logina. We have Hota Mata, who is a business leader and entrepreneur. We have Lindwe Matali, who is a business leader and entrepreneur. We have Sandile Zungu, who is the CEO of um, Business Leadership SA. Um, we have Wasim Karim, who is the CEO of the NYDA. Uh, we have Cecil Messi, who is the CEO of one of the teachers who have joined us tonight, um, as well as the convener of the ANC Youth League's National Youth Task Team. So I think I, I have said a mouthful in terms of the titles that these um, various individuals carry. So without wasting any further time, I will request that they introduce themselves. And post introducing themselves, I will give everyone a minute to give a high end um, understanding of the problem and provide a solution within that minute. So as you introduce yourself, looking at unemployment and youth skills development, look, mention a problem and how it is that you see best to um, solve the problem within a minute. So I would suggest you focus 15 seconds on tabling out the, pro um, the problem and the rest of the 45 seconds in addressing it in a solution. I will start off with the Deputy Minister, Putimana Mela. DM, thank you very much. Your minute is to give us a high-end diagnosis of the current crisis that we are facing, but also within that one minute, provide a solution. Whoa, oh, oh, okay. All right, look, I think, 
I think drawing from what the, the uh, former statistician general uh, just said, that part of the big problem is obviously around skills um, and uh, the connection between those who get uh, trained and uh, you know the labor market, but also the connection between those who get <coughs> who get trained uh, and then pursuing entrepreneurial uh, uh, you know activities and some form of support from government. And I think part of the bigger problem, uh, uh, or uh, probably a bigger solution, which uh, 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 you know I think that we all need to put our heads together is uh, how do we have the multiplicity of government agencies, government departments, civil society, but also business um, and young people themselves intervening, uh, you know, in terms of one uh, uh, unemployed young person. Uh, you know, so, so for me, I think it's about the collaboration of a whole range of uh, uh, people and institutions that can intervene to create platforms for young people to be able to so, so I'm just mentioning one and I'm hoping to come back later on uh, with, with thank you very much deputy minister putimana mela i will now hand over to deputy minister nomalunge lokina to please introduce herself as well as give us a high-end diagnosis of the current challenges that are faced as well as provide a possible solution thank you thank you very much uh, program directors a uh, good evening to let me let me say I'm observing the protocol so that I, I save my time. I'm Nomalunge Logina, the Deputy Minister of Trade of uh, Department of Trade, Industry and Competitions. Uh, the problem and the challenge, as we are saying, that one has identified and even taking it from what the statistician has been saying. Yes, we all agree is the high level of unemployment and more youth, unfortunately, is getting into that category adding to a uh, more le levels of e poverty as we see in our country the levels of e poverty is growing and with all the experiences that we have seen even from the past week and during the times of covid what can we do to mitigate the challenges and this and the bad situation that our country is faced with Yes, when looking at all the departments, you will all agree that there are efforts, there are means, there are programs that uh, the government is trying to mitigate. And also, with all the agencies working even with the private sector as to say how best can we open up opportunities because we all understand that, yes, our youth can go through the schooling system, but the number of jobs and the opportunities are very limited. So for me, one of the solutions that I'm thinking of is the well-coordinated and targeted plan from various departments, from various agencies, because I can assure you, go to all the departments, they will tell you that we have got one, two, and three program that we are trying to find that the incentives that we are having. But if they are not well-coordinated and well advocated for our youth, for our public out there to know. For me, we're not going, we'll always be fighting a losing battle as the government, as, as, as the country. So as I'm here, I can come up, I can lay a lot of incentives, the agencies that we have within the Department of Trade and Industry. But if it doesn't talk to other departments where you look at the whole value chains and make sure that when it comes to the incentives and the assistant and the funding it really stretches and cover a lot of our young people. We are not going to be winning as, as, as our government. So for me, let us sit together, let us work in a very targeted and coordinated, coordinated manner into say, with the legal that we have as government, with the legal that the private sector can bring together, how best can we stretch our resources in making sure that more opportunities are offered and, 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 and given to our young people to make sure that they become and make sure that they play their part in the mainstream economy of our country. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Deputy Minister Numalunga Nokina. Um, just to add on to your solution, I'd also like to, I, I think that it's equally important that the plan that government does have, right, or so the, the well-coordinated plan that government does put up is informed by the realities on the ground, is informed by the realities of young South Africans right now, right? Because I do not believe that there is no plan that is currently existing. I mean, we are currently under um, the plan of an NDP, right? Uh, the National Development Plan, Vision 2030. However, we look at it and we look at how far we have to go to reach it. And maybe some of us look at it in a more, far more critical manner and say, it might just be a pipeline dream. It wasn't informed by the reality of where we were at its inception and how is it that we're going to go forth from that. And also, just to ring a bell on you, um, I do also think that maybe we do need a little bit more of planning, of monitoring and evaluation, not as much planning, because I think we plan, 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 but how is it that we monitor our impact and um, evaluate how is it that we change the people's lives? So to not waste any time, I'll go on to Khota Maja, who is a business leader and entrepreneur, to introduce himself and also give us a high-end presentation of the current challenges as well as solution. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Maja. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Loazi and Kondisi. Look, uh, for me, the problem of youth unemployment is well known and well reported. In fact, I think it's even bigger than reported by the states there, because even those young people who are employed, most of them are either underemployed, meaning that there's a mismatch between the quality of their skills and the job role that they are in currently and some are in precarious job roles where there's very little job security. So I, I think uh, you've correctly you know, stated that more time should be spent on identifying where the bottlenecks are and creating specific interventions. But because I'm a social entrepreneur, I'm involved with creating socioeconomic development strategies and initiatives, driving enterprise development in communities, my input will be preoccupied mostly with what is the role of entrepreneurship as a possible pathway out of unemployment. So we must acknowledge that entrepreneurship plays a very important role in the economy. In South Africa, for instance, our small enterprises employ between 50 to 60 percent of the total labor force, and they contribute towards over 30 percent of the GDP. However, there's still a lot of challenges in this space, which I can come back to Razi and Kondisi later in the discussion. But some of my suggestions there or solutions would be, for instance, formalization. Uh, so the government can help with formalizing um, SMMEs so that they can be you know, eligible for support and, and funding and so on, but also to set them on a growth path. You know, the financial system must also be more flexible towards uh, SMMEs, especially youth entrepreneurs, and relax some of their uh, requirements. The tax regime as well is something that should be looked at so that it can be more entrepreneurship friendly. There's many other suggestions and thoughts on this, and I'm hoping to have an opportunity to share them throughout the conversation. Thank you, Lazi and Thank you, Thank you. very much, Koto. Um, without wasting any further time, I will hand over to Lindy Matali to introduce herself, as well as give us a high-end presentation of the challenges that we are faced with. Thank you so much, um, and good evening to the panelists, the uh, protocol of ZEP. Um, I think, for me, the challenge um, in South Africa that we have right now is that we are not creating opportunities for everyone. And and, and, and the reason for that is because I also feel that our government has too much focus on looking for solutions from big business. We know that big business, they don't create employment. And even the innovations that they do is focused on efficiency innovation, which is geared towards reducing the resources, including home, um, you know, human resource. So you, you are not gonna get a solution from NetBank, you know, just to name a few, to, to give you the answers because they are not the employers. And so as as much as long as we are focused on uh, putting too much value and priorities on big business, we are never going to um, to solve the problem of unemployment in the country. Um, Dr. Luhutla mentioned the issue of, of, of the pipeline. 
we are not creating even enough young people that are graduating in high school. And also, if you think about that, if you start looking at the subject like STEM, we even have very, very few young people that pursue STEM in high school. And you can look at any any um, country that is in you know the G7 or the most um, developed countries. You will find out that a lot of the innovations that they have and the growth comes from actually industries like in the engineering, in the STEM sector. So if we continue to just be happy with having one million young people graduating high school, how do they graduate? I mean, I sit on the board of NEPSAS and the minister. Uh, the, Ministers aware, and we know like the kind of degrees that we are also funding. The majority of them, we know that we are funding young people who are gonna come and have the degree and be unemployed. So that has to change. So we need to look at how do we create um the dense flow. We know um, opportunities in South Africa is not an issue. The problem yeah. is um the opportunities that we have is already benefiting those who are already in the system. And I believe that opportunity dances with those already on the dance floor. Right now, the dance floor is very small. Mm. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Mr. Sandile Zungu. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ndombiase. Yes, I'm saying. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Sandile Zungu. I'm the president of the Black Business Council, BBC. Um, and in my other capacity, I'm the president of uh, Amazon Football Club. And of course, I'm uh, the founder and chairman of my family organization, Zoom Investments Company. So that's, I'm steeped in that's business. An one. That's <laughs> an important one. <laughs> <laughs> so by, 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 by the end of this um, august uh, gathering, I hope everyone can say, hey, be usut. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to, to cut to the chase, you know, the, the, the problem as very uh, eloquently enunciated by um, statistician general um, resonates with me. You know, when you talk about the triple challenges of <clears throat> unemployment, inequality, poverty, um, it, it, it affects the young people. Young people are not just about unemployment. Um, young people are, 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 are becoming the face of the triple challenges. And um, so when you say, what is the problem? The problem is all of the above. And the fact that uh, when you talk about a cliche, of uh, this being a ticking time bomb um, that will explode in our faces sometime. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dangerous cliche for a nation so powerful as South Africa to have. So the agency to, to resolve it is, 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 is for all to see. And in business, we take the challenge and that probably as business, we have not done enough to deal with this challenge. And the point that I liked a lot is one by, by Lindy, um, Lindy, just now. Lindy says, we have tended to rely a lot on solutions from big business. And you can probably understand why that is so. Um, just as mining, the commodity boom is upon us, um, you'll have seen big organizations like Anglo-American, uh, Kumba Iron Ore, and a few others announce their results for the, for the half year. And they're declaring massive dividends. And those massive dividends are allowing South Africa to intervene to the point of restoring the 350 rands that uh, the Minister of Finance announced uh, just a day or so ago. Uh, and therefore, the dependence on South Africans to those who pay the piper um, steeps us into this problem in the long term. Yet we know, um, as Linda did, did say, that um, small enterprises 
Um, Initiative Hortz said that the small enterprise SMMEs um, are the biggest employers in the country. And so if you're going to address the challenge of unemployment and skills development, especially among young people, you, you cannot look at that sector of the economy, which is uh, for its survival, for its ongoing competitiveness, looking at um, efficiencies with expansion. So you've got to have a situation where the SMME sector is taken a lot more seriously. And it is when the SMME sector is thriving that young people begin to leave the experience that they can actually become employers themselves. They don't have to look at the formal market for their own salvation. And um, it is also true that those economies where there is a symbiotic relationship between big business and the SME sector are those that we are uh, growing to admire. Whether you talk about Italy, uh, you talk about China, you talk about India, uh, and other economies, including Mexico, for that matter, and Turkey. It is those economies where the SME sector is taken a lot more seriously by government and it is integrated by big business into their supply chains. And in my opinion, um, that is a sweeping brush on where our salvation in terms of the issue of youth skills and unemployment uh, and even entrepreneurship, I must add, uh, therein lie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zungu. Um, what you've highlighted and what Kota has equally highlighted brings me to the question of why is it that we have a Department of Trade and Industry and a Department of Small Business Enterprises, right? But I guess we'll dive into that at a further, um, deeper into the conversation. I'll now hand over to the CEO of the NYTA, Mr. Wasim Karim. Uh, thanks, Loisy, and greetings to everybody. So I wanted to take a slightly different track to, to the rest of my panelists. And I wanted to argue that Youth unemployment is should never be the singular challenge that we focus on as South Africans, simply because youth unemployment simply represents an outcome of what we are as society. What we should be focusing on is youth development, right? Which is the holistic, linguistic, educational socialization of our young people. Um, as they move through different transitions in their life and a recognition that no two young people are the same and that we need different levels of support and different levels of transition for many young South Africans. Now, there's numerous solutions that many of us will put on the table today, but I wanna argue in favor of one in particular. And I wanna argue in favor of revitalizing the National Youth Service in South Africa simply because national service brings to the fore many of the values that we seem not to have encouraged, right? So national youth service has the ability to combine skills development as well as income support, but more importantly, it emphasizes the importance of community support and community development through the energies and through the passions of our young people. I'll argue that for all of our development as South Africans, we've never truly identified the value systems that we want to have at individual level, at family level, and at country level. And we have never passed a value system or cohesive value system to our young people. Yes, it exists in many differential forms, but at country level, I don't think we've, we've meaningfully addressed it. And I think it is reflecting in our youth development outcomes. Lastly, I want to say that I don't think we should ever shy away from the strength of public employment, particularly the state acting as a public employer. When we talk to young people who are engaged in programs like the Expanded Public Works and the Community Works Program, we see how much it contributes to the quality of their life. Because when you put income in a young person's hands, not only do you increase a young person's income, you increase household incomes. And when you increase household incomes, you decrease poverty and you, you have better educational and better social outcomes. Thanks very much, Liaz. Thank you very much, CEO. Um, I'll now hand over to another CEO 
Um, Ceci Mercy. So please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dwazi and um, Kondisi, for the opportunity. I think a lot has been said in terms of the the problem that uh, we are facing. And I want to align myself with the former statistician uh, in saying that um, youth unemployment and unemployment generally in our country uh, leads to poverty, leads to inequalities. And therefore, if we can resolve and solve the challenge of unemployment, especially among the young people, we're not going to be talking poverty and not talking inequalities. Uh, that's the, the major thing that we have to do. And again, not only talking about youth unemployment, but uh, let's talk about ways of dealing with that. As the Deputy Minister uh, Guinea has uh, indicated, what I wrote initially when I was thinking, I, I see ourselves, each and every one, having a piece of a puzzle, but no one gets to the center where all of us put those pieces of puzzle and complete the puzzle. So everyone is doing something, but uh, that's something uh, needs to be coordinated. That something needs to be put together for us to see the impact. And one is not saying that whatever is happening is not uh, good enough. However, it is very less sustainable. We need to join hands uh, like we do today, not only in talking, but also in action. What is the solution? I'm not gonna get long to that because we are seeking solutions. We don't have uh, the, the, the best way. Hence, we are gathering here today to talk about that. But if we can uh, look at the complete reconstruction of our education system, I can tell you where I sit, I can fix my uh, dress hemming, um, I can fix my buttons, uh, I can do some of the things because I was taught how to sew and do other things. But uh, the, today's curriculum has deprived a lot of our children of the skills that they should have had when they grow up. So we needed to reconstruct our education system as well as reconstructing our labor market system and ensure that the education system talks to the labor market system and the labor market system talks to our education system. And therefore, our young people don't have to be trained or skilled in getting a job. We need to look at the, at the occupations and stop talking about job because jobs come and go. We need to make sure that if uh, plumbing jobs are not there, one can move to another and multi-skill uh, the young people and ensure that we create as many as uh, multi-skilled entrepreneurs that are able to apply one set of knowledge and skills to another situation. And in so doing, they will never go hungry because the kind of the education that they have received makes them to be critical thinkers, makes them to be innovative. Hence I'm saying, let us reconstruct our education system and reconstruct our labor market. And I want to conclude by saying, training for the sake of training is not a solution. There's a lot of money that we have wasted in just ticking a box. It's time to act and making sure that uh, we do what we know to do and we do know what we're supposed to be knowing and we do have the resources uh, in our country. And therefore the issues of uh, exporting our minerals should come to an end. Uh, that's how we can do in reconstructing education system and reconstructing the labor market and create some kind of uh, coherence between the two. Thanks, uh, I will just pause there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists for giving us a high-end understanding of what it is that the challenges that we are faced with are. Um, to continue going deeper in this conversation, I'll hand over to my co-facilitator, Mbondisi, who has been making notes of every little detail that has been mentioned tonight. 
and he's the one really that's going to grill us all. So thank you, Mgondis. I really wish that I was here on a happier subject, but if you heard what I heard from the former statistician general and it didn't hurt you to hear it, I don't think that you understand the gravity of the situation. So 27 years in now, the urgent hope that Minister Manamela was talking about desperately needed, the lamentations piling up, not only on this panel, but also on the social media channels in the, in the chat that we're seeing. I have a number of questions about some of the things that we've already discussed. It's disconcerting to me that we're moving backwards in real statistical terms. And yet there are some of the suggestions which indicate that perhaps a small incremental amount is needed. So I'm far more in the camp where I think that if you see the slides, a revolution is necessary. And I think the urgency which opened up the session from the um, Deputy Minister Pudima Namela is the, the tenor in which I would like to conduct the next part of our conversation. I think one of the things that I'd like to open up with and, you know, reading the social media comments and also hearing what has been said is the idea that um, there's a coordination issue at play. And I'm very grateful to start off with that because no matter what we say the solutions will be, coordination at the center will be one of the things that are required. Now, I recall that the coordination point was being made by a colleague of the person that I thought was the coordinator. So I'd like to maybe open up this, 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 this conversation by going back to DM Nomalunga Lokina and to speak a little about who is the coordinator, who should coordinate, and how should they coordinate differently? I think what we'll do is, Deputy Minister, while I wait for you to go and mute, one of the other points of discussion that I thought that um, we could pick up is perhaps I could um, have a conversation with the other panelists. And then um, one of the things that we can do is come back to your coordination question, because it will be relevant at no matter, uh, no matter which juncture it's in. Um, we've heard a lot about the SME, um, the SME part of the discussion. We have a social entrepreneur who is um, interested in it take, being taken more seriously. We understand that the million or so small businesses, which are decreasing by the day because of the challenges that have been faced recently, are decreasing. And yet, these are the people that are the employers and the people who we should see as the employers, according to Lindy or Mathan. So one of the things that I want to pick up is why aren't SMEs taken seriously? I mean, is it, is, it, is it too simple to suggest that one million SMEs employing five more people would equal five million jobs? What am I getting wrong? What am I missing? Could I have got to Mr. Khotsomaja first, and then could we come back to Ms. Lindy um, straight after that, please? All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for the question, Ms. Look. The reason that, uh, and if I am to be direct in responding to your question, that uh, SMEs are not taken seriously is the question of culture. So in South Africa, we do not necessarily have a culture that supports inter entrepreneurship. In the communities where you grow up, um, there's a particular expectation of a linear growth of a young person um, from school to, if possible, post school and then to a career, meaning formal employment and then retirement, and that's the idea. So even though states would give us a different reality, our culture is yet to conform to that reality. There is a leader who is my favorite, is a former president of Singapore, and his name is Tony Kang Keng Yam. So he speaks about what he calls an entrepreneurial society. And that entrepreneurial society is characterized by three important things. One is an active government as an enabler of entrepreneurship, of course, through a favorable, a favorable policy environment, like some of the suggestions I've already shared around the tax regime, the financing institutions and so forth. And secondly, the role of the private sector as well as a partner so in South Africa, we speak a lot about the idea of a social compact, the role of big business. In the course I'm doing now, we talk about 
the role of business in society. So their role is to also inculcate that spirit of entrepreneurship through enterprise development programs and, 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 and other interventions. And third and last is the role of society as a whole in inspiring its youth to take up entrepreneurship, to you know, be innovative and creative, and to solve their societal problems using entrepreneurial solutions. Once you have the question of culture addressed, you are going to have the business sector as well as the public sector that will work in that type of social compact, I mean, to, to achieve what we need to achieve. I'm not sure if that answers the, the question, uh, Kondisi. Excellent. Ms. Lindy, Ms. Lindy Omakar, Mr. Godfrey Maja has um, spoken about the cultural issue in relation to SMEs. Can you give us a perspective on this SME question? I, you know, the question when you asked, when you said, why aren't we, um, you know, taking SME seriously? I'm going to say something a little bit more controversial, but I think it's, it's important, um, is that, you know, unfortunately, it's very, in our government right now, a lot of investment goes to big business because also what those people can get. And that's a fact. If you support a small entrepreneur, you're not going to get much from them. And I think that is part of the problem. And also, and also a challenge that I've seen also with our government is that we're not, the, the, I think also as a country, we're not very good in uh, identifying and supporting our talent. We're very good at the end of it. When you are so successful, like somebody like Mr. Sandy Lezun, where everybody's like, oh my God, he owns Abasuf, you know, like uh, the Zulu. Now we are, you know, but when he started, if you if you will be honest, how many people supported him and saw that potential? So the big problem with that is that unless we change the way we, we see our, I mean, um, Dr. Lihutla mentioned something that was kind of um, hard to hear, but true, that we are a country that is basically eating its children. And if we are not creating the opportunities, if we are not exposing our young people, I don't even think the issue is the fact that, you know, they are not, the culture of entrepreneurship is not there. Is that if you go to Soweto and you ask a young person what business you're going to start, they're probably going to tell you they're going to start um, a car wash or they're going to start a restaurant. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's because that's what they've been exposed to. So um, even in terms of what our education system, you know, this, uh, is, we're not even teaching our young people how to identify and look at opportunity. I can just go to even in literature or just talk about a, a guy that we all love and adore, um, the late um, Kirsten, um, Clayton Christensen, who was a professor at Harvard, who, who actually did the research on disruptive innovation. And, and he talked about how a disruption happen. But now it's more like, you know, you have to come with this entrepreneur that comes up with something new. That's not what disruptive innovation is, is, is being able to find a, a market that is underserved and serve it. And the majority of that market that is underserved is in the township, is our black people. Even then, it's not, we even when that uh, opportunities are found, it's not us who will benefit. You know, I always make an example of, of Capitech, for example. Before Capitech, it was an issue of, you know, we're having the, 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 uh, the Mzansi account, which was really horrible. It didn't give anybody anything. And they saw and they identified a market that wasn't saved and they created. And then within a few years, we've got now Capitech as one of, of the top five banks. So, but then who are they making their money from? Who are the people? So I think it's really important that we identify that's the issue, but also teach young people to come up with market creating innovations because those are the ones that create jobs. Those are the ones that create new industries and support um, the communities as well. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to bring in Mr. Sandy Lezum. Um, the only Hebe Usu who is going to get from me is because as a football club owner, he is an employer of the youth. But beyond that, I'm going to need you to ground me, Sengwai. Um, you've uh, sp spoken about some international examples. We've spoken about a cultural issue. We've also spoken about the fact that we don't support our talent. How do we get this right to rejig these things now that we've identified? And these things play out every day in business. Now, we've understood from your previous comments that big business 
does contribute to the money that ultimately gets funneled into other social programs. But how do we address this SME part, which the two previous panelists have spoken about? Well, that's a very important question. Um, I think it just requires a mindset shift and change. Let's just take a simple example. Because, you know, the, the problem is not defined as a problem, but it's a micro, it's got many microcosms. And therefore, it's very easy to just home in on one example and be able to begin to appreciate as you solve it and multiply to other areas um, and the picture can be solved. Just take the issue of the, um, what is called um, loan guarantee scheme which the president announced as one of the uh, relief measures uh, a couple of months ago. How it was supposed to work is that 200 billion rands um, will be released into the system uh, by commercial banks underpinned by national treasury um, to especially small businesses, uh, which were hit hard by COVID. Um, you know, uh, uh, the challenges, especially during the hard lockdown. 200 billion rands, everyone applauded. Um, a couple of months later, um, only 17 billion rands will have been dispersed. In other words, another 183 billion rands lies unutilized uh, to provide a relief to the SME sector, which desperately needs this capital. So what do you say is a problem? One, the problem is, um, sadly, banks in this country, in my opinion, humble opinion, um, will have become very complacent, um, and to use maybe a harsher word, lazy, uh, because most of their lending is advanced to multinationals uh, who are triple A rated in terms of credit rating. Um, even if when they land to the state, SOEs, it's underpinned by national treasure, by government. Um, the risk is high, but because it's secured by national treasury, um, they make a killing out of it. Um, they ask themselves, why must we go out to the SME sector where the risk is very high, where there's no security of, 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 of success? And uh, when we're making such easy money, they become very comfortable. So. I think one of the conversations that need to be heard with banks is what risk are you taking? How are you meeting society halfway? Um, and, and for government to really persuade them to fulfill what commercial banks are supposed to fulfill, take the requisite risk, price it accordingly, and make a return. Uh, there would be losses from time to time. So that kind of conversation, if I use that loan guarantee scheme as just one example, solution, have a conversation, government, a read, route, act, continue to provide the security that you need to provide because you cannot afford to have banks um, rated as very risky, especially the, the security of our financial system is, is critical for our own development. But within that, someone has got to read the right act. Now, when we talk about um, a system which is very harshly disposed towards SMME, it is South Africa's uh, situation. And this is not a, a post-apartheid phenomenon. It dates back to the architecture of, of our colonial economy. And so when one talks about structural um, adjustments, and structural changes to our economy. Um, it has to address this issue of where do SMMEs fit in our quest for sustainable economic growth, um, for employment creation, especially amongst young people. So, um, I mean, without taking too much of time, it goes back to the old um, adage, let's talk. Um, when all the stakeholders have been correctly identified and they sit around the uh, table and have frank conversations, solutions do come up. And trust me, there's sufficient depth of intellectual capital in South Africa. And we have a very supportive government. It takes a flag 
uh, in more, some of the things and initiatives that our government is undertaking are not done in many developed economies. People are just allowed to fend for themselves. Um, our government is supportive, uh, but what we have, what we lack, is um, is kind of coherence, courage, and bravery to to do the right things. And when people have yeah. frank conversations around the table, and trust me, we can find the solutions. But um, uh, others will say, ah, government lacks political will. Um, maybe that's um, that's a frank diagnosis of the situation. Do they have the courage to read the right act? Do they have the courage to be true to their own convictions? Or at the slightest provocation, they kowtow to big business interests, which, I, as I said, uh, can be very lazy. All right. Can I take that point here? And can I move back? I'm hoping that I can get back to Deputy Minister Numalunga Lakina. I'm hoping that um, our technical issue may have been resolved. Because I hear, I hear Mr. Sandy Lezum was saying that the Riot Act needs to be read, and he said that that needed to be read to the banks. But one of the things that I have observed in this loan guarantee scheme is that the government owns its own institutions called DFIs. There is the IDC, the NEF, the CIFA, and a range of others. If there's a Riot Act that needs to be read, it seems like these Riot Acts can be read in these DFIs that are in the ambit of the control of the people who are in government right now. Why are they not dispensing the money that we have as a South African people according to our needs? Deputy Minister, do you have a comment? I hope I can be heard now. Yes, you are loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much for, for, for that. The, the first question you were saying, it, it was on the issue of coordination. And now I still, we are still on that question again, as to say, we do have these agencies, our uh, DFIs and so forth, of which I always, even when one engages them with them, as to say, the deep part of it is very important as to say, they are the developmental financial agencies that we have, of which sometimes we do lack that leg of being developmental because as we are talking to the issues of SMMEs, we're talking to the issues of young people or whoever who is new in the business where they need to be developed. But most of the time, that is where we lack or they lack that developmental part of it whenever whenever you get into business or we are starting a business, there are challenges that you are faced with. And if we lack the developmental part of it as these agencies, that is where we see a lot of our, of our young entrepreneurs, so we young entrants into, into business failing. So it's one point that I'm saying again, it goes back to the issue of coordination, an issue of monitoring, an issue of, 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 of development. So, as you have asked at first, who is supposed to be doing this? Yes, for me, I fully agree. We've got DPME, where it is coordinated at the level of the presidency. I, have, don't, I don't have a, a, a problem with that. But I still say, even within each and every department and between the department themselves, before it even gets into the level of the presidency, that issue of coordination is very important on what you are doing. I can make a very practical example of the fight and the battle that you are having, just making an example of the department that I'm in, where you find it. There are so many divisions with various schemes, but you find that if one division does not know what another division is doing, you find that we have got a lot of people, very few, that are, deep, are double dipping or dipping whatever times. If we can't coordinate that, we, we, we let one hand know, even within the same department. So it's a huge challenge that you are working on. And I think if we can win that one, even within the departments themselves, as we go up and say who is monitoring, who is coordinating, it will be easy. But also, I'm not looking down on the, the role that needs to be played by even our beneficiaries, even those who still want to get in. That pressure that they're putting in various departments, for me, it makes it even easier for the department even to look at, say, 
are we really doing it? That flooding, that if we, we get that pressure, it, it's part of a monitoring, it's part of a coordination where we are saying that really, what is it that you are doing as various departments? So as I'm saying, various agencies that you are having, but we just need to coordinate them. And starting from each department, starting from each uh, stakeholder, then goes up to uh, DPME where they can coordinate because we even want to see a DPME playing a really a role where as departments will always be on our toes as to say quarterly or now and again we need to have those reports on those coordination. I, I still say it's a very important part that you need to have in our country. Thank you very much. I see. On that, could I please bring in Mr. Rudy Dix? Um, Mr. Mr. Dix, are you available? I'm 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 starting to sense yes. the I'm starting to sense the exasperation that's coming through my phone and my social media feeds. You're the head of projects in the presidency, and it seems that we are failing to dispense 200 billion rand. We've gone to four institutions that have not been able to dispense it. We have literal root, looting and riot on the streets. And there's 187 billion at last count still sitting in bank accounts. And one of your cabinet colleagues has said that coordination is the problem. As head of projects, can you help me with the coordination of dispensing the 187 billion reasons why young people on this um, webinar should have hope that something new is going to happen tomorrow? Let's start off first about what we need to do, right? So DMs are not my colleagues. They are our deputy ministers, right? So just correct that. I'm the head of project management in the private office of the president. And the president has tasked me to work on developing a coordinated program around youth, which is called presidential youth employment intervention. Mm -hmm. There are many components of what needs to be intervened and what needs to happen. The 200 billion is part of the credit guarantee scheme. That's only one, and the response around the, C, uh, the credit guarantee scheme was uh, largely to be able to deal with businesses, small businesses, uh, large firms also affected as a result of the COVID impact. Of course, um, the, the ability to spend that money depends on the design of the program. So the program was designed in a manner that uh, was extremely risk averse. Um, um, it didn't allow for high levels of impairment. Um, it was largely loans um, and not grant making. So, of course, that has an impact on people wanting to uh, borrow at the particular cost. Right? So, so it is the banks and mostly the commercial banks that have dispensed that. Now, more recently, the president has made it very clear that what he wants to do is see a reform of the credit guarantee scheme and to ensure that both uh, commercial banks and DFIs, development finance institutions like the, like the IDC and others, are able to dispense to support businesses. And if we are able to target correctly this kind of businesses, we'll find that a lot of them are uh, small businesses owned by young people, very innovative, uh, young entrepreneurs. The, the point that I wanted to make is largely the fact that I think, uh, you know, when I listen to colleagues speaking, we talk a lot about what we can do for young people and not what we should do right now for the millions of young people who can't wait for changes in the structure of the economy, who can't wait for investments around localization, who can't wait for growth in this sector, or, um, you know, who can't wait for changes around whether we, uh, you know, beneficiate yoli. That's the kind of strategy that we need to implement and coordinate, and that's what we're trying to do. How do we address fundamentally the millions of young people right now that don't have any opportunities of earning? And so fundamentally, that's what we need to coordinate, and that's what we're doing in the president's office in trying to in trying to coordinate a program that will intervene fundamentally in trying to address young people. So there's a multi-pronged approach. It's not going to solve all the problems of young people um, in terms of education. We need to ensure that many of the departments are going to be able to uh, deal with it. But ours is about trying to ensure that we partner with NPOs, that we partner with the private sector, to ensure that young people are able to earn some form of money, right? And this is through youth service. This is through demand skills training. I heard one of the panelists speak about the fact that we shouldn't just churn out skills um, for the sake of churning out skills, but in actual fact, talking through what we refer to as demand-led skills training, which is a pay-for-performance model. Basically, you know, firms being paid 
for training young people when they are placed in a job, not by whether they've been trained or not. Um, establishing, for example, uh, a national pathway management also, because many young people spend a lot of money doing job search. So we have now established formally a national pathway management network in partnership with the Arambi Accelerator to try and ensure that there's a single sign for young people that we're able to track where they go to, we're able to understand where they can go to, because it's about earning an income and young people zigzag in and out of different jobs in and out of entrepreneurship and self-employment opportunities. And for us, that's the critical thing. So it's not only about formal employment, it's about creating an income opportunity for young people so that we're able to direct them in the right. In the right. So it's a multi-pronged approach. And the scale is quite important because we have to look at hundreds of thousands and even millions of young people that we can support right now in getting some form of income. And I think it's important for us to clarify that it's not about the future, it's about right now. And that's what we want to do. If you had to coordinate this right now, who is the person to do that, Mr. Dix? I appreciate it's not you and I, um, I'm, Ooh, I'm leveraging I'm coordinating your... it. I just told you now. I'm busy coordinating the program, right? And we have a partnership with a mul multitude of different departments and, uh, and, uh, and, um, you know, and partnerships inside and outside of government. So I am coordinating the program as the head of the project management office in the office <laughs> of the president. Before this is out, if I could ask you to come back, I just think that a lot of people on who are listening will want to hear the the details of how to get hold of you and that type of thing. But I appreciate your input. My final, my okay. fi my time is always my, my my time for this section is almost up. But I'd like to bring in Wasim Karim because I was very interested in the proposed solution that you had. Um, it was a national um, a national youth service. It seemed to me like it was something that was practical, tangible, could be funded right now and could roll out a productive use of young people's time. And there is some funding that could be put beyond that. So, Wasim, I think before I invite Luazi back um, after your comments, could you give me a sense of how big would this, um, how big would this youth service be, how much it would take to fund, um, how are you seeing navigating this for the right now solution that Mr. Dix was talking about um, a minute ago, as opposed to it happening in the fullness of time sometime in the future? Yeah, thanks, Program Director. So it's actually, I mean, it's, it's nice to have the Deputy Minister in the room because in, in the youth policy we championed with the Deputy Minister, we, we would have introduced the concept of a revitalized national youth service, and that was already way back around 2014, 2015. Um, and, and Rudy Dix and other colleagues have, have helped us start to bring that vision to life, right? And, and I mean, youth service has been used by numerous countries around the world. Some countries use it for nation building. Some countries use it for social cohesion. Lots of countries use it for skills development or, or to, to, to plug holes in the public service. Um, and, and, and I'd encourage colleagues to, to read a bit about youth service because I think it brings so many different attributes um, to the development of young people, but also to the development of the country, right? But I'll speak to how we see youth service unfolding in South Africa and, and something that's really going to happen now. Um, so we've designed National Youth Service as a structured 12-month program. We also want young people to we don't just want to go out and recruit young people and say, come and be a youth service participant. We want to make youth service something that a young person aspires to, right? We want to know why you want to do service to your country. You know, what difference do you make it in your life? But but also when a young person enters this 12-month service program, we want them to know what their expectations of us and what our expectations of them, you know? So you don't have this bouncing around from, from a youth service program to EPWP we create an effective pathway, right? We want to pay 16 hours a week of paid service to that young person um, at the national minimum wage because that equates to us, at least every young person receiving something which matches the poverty line in South Africa, which is about 1,600. So our, our view is a payment of 1,800 a month to each young person participating. And then I think the sectors are really exciting, but also really important, right? Because the sectors we're thinking about, I mean, all of us here in this room probably remember how much of a role after school programs um, played in our lives, whether it was sports or whether it was art or debate or chess. 
much of those things shaped us, right? And, and I think we've seen how after school programs have largely fallen to the back burner in public schools. So here's an opportunity using existing community development organizations, using our young people as assets to reinvigorate after school programs, right? Um, what about tackling alcohol, substance abuse, and gender-based violence through community support groups, you know? There's another opportunity to use our young people in assets in addressing some of South Africa's social problems, allow them to earn an income, but then also learn skills in that period, right? One of the things I've been looking at is how can a young person who's enrolled on a service program get a driver's license? Right now, we have 20,000 shortage of driver's licenses in South Africa. Driver's license is not that difficult as a skills development program, right? And you incorporate that into a youth service. It means at the end of 12 months, a young person has a nice exit. So the design is ready. The funding is ready. And this year, we're going to take 25,000 young people into a youth service program. And we hope just keep scaling that, keep doubling that number every year, and to make service a critical component of the development agenda. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Wasim. It's, um, I think it's encouraging news, and it's the news that the youth want to hear, that 25,000 opportunities are funded and ready and are, are happening. Like um, I asked with Mr. Dix before, this is over, I'll ask you for some contact information, although I hope that you are well known amongst the youth. and. Um, I think one of the things that I'd like us to pick up on are all the programs that still have space for the youth to take up, whether it's the youth service, whether it's the CETAs who are well represented on here, where young people can find a tomorrow morning action that can navigate them towards the future they're hoping for. But um, before we continue, I see that uh, Mr. Dix, um, was that a hand that I saw? That was, was, sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing that I completely forgot, and this is so important. I mean, Wasim has been partnering with us on developing part of the interventions, and that's one of the, the nicest things about us bringing in different components of government and, uh, and, and external organizations. But there's one particular program that I think we've recently run last year, and many people know about this, is the DBE program, the school program, which is the school um, education and teacher assistance, where we had 320,000 young kids across all 24,000 schools participating in a program paid at minimum wages over the past six months. Now, that's a phenomenal reach. That's one of the largest public employment programs where 70% of those young people are women, 99% of them are young people. And the first phase was very successful. Was I just wanted to say to you, I mean, I can fi finally confirm even on this platform that we are going to get funding to extend that program again into this coming year until the next financial year also. So more opportunities that we will make available for young people at scale. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dix. Um, and thank you to our um, previous speakers and panelists. And I think this is what we're seeking to get out of that chat, right? That chat is a conversation that is constructive. That chat is a conversation where young people interact with various spheres of the state, right? Because we cannot exist in silos. We cannot exist and speak on our own. It is important that we have such conversations, that we know of such opportunities, and that we know of how to access them. Because um, someone always says, there's a politician I will not quote, who always says, government has the best kept secrets. Um, they, we tell ourselves, that government is working, and government tells themselves they are working. However, people at grassroots level cannot feel the impact. So it is so important that such conversations do take place, and they happen very frequently. So Nkondi said I are now going to bring in other viewers from home. Um, we know very well that we both don't have all the questions to ask this um, panel that sits in front of us. We don't have the answers neither. So I will be opening up. We will be reading the questions that have been posed to us because we understand that um, others are coming in from YouTube, others are coming in from um, other various platforms of social media, such as Facebook. So the first question I will ask um, came from YouTube, is by Renee Sikwari. And it says, Deputy Minister, how will government working alongside the private sector ensure job creation programs are implemented? Um, will it not have to create a youth um, employment creation scheme that is similar to BEE 
So give some form of incentive um, for large corporations and small corporations as well to hire young people. And I think this would, have, would be a question best posed to the Deputy Minister in, the, in DTI. It's not connected. Deputy Minister Budimanamelo, if you could please take this question. Uh, um, look, Rudy is actually has been responsible for youth employment service with uh, the NYD, and I think the better place to uh, to respond to that. But uh, the the I think the important thing about uh, you know the youth employment service that. Uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, the person who asked the question. Uh, uh, you know, the first the intention was to draw in young people on a massive scale, expose them to workplace or experiential training, have them get some form of income, but also more importantly, uh, you know, improve their skills and income and and competence. Uh, you know, so that they're able to um, easily be integrated into the workplace. And I think, uh, you know, we, we probably uh, may get some figures in terms of the progress that has been done with regards to the, to the implementation of the Youth Employment Service. But what was also crucial about the Youth Employment Service was the skills component. I think we all hear... Uh, and, and, and business have always been talking about the fact that we, uh, you know, do not get young people who come from our TVET colleges or from our universities who have the requisite skills and experience. But I think that, uh, you know, the youth employment service was an issue. So I don't know if, if, if Rudy wants to take that or was he. So, DM, you speak about a project that was um, known by many. I think it, it went under the title Yes for Youth, right? It was a, a youth employment readiness program. Um, and having worked in the NGO sphere, particularly with youth development, um, I'm well aware of the fact that it was a program that brought young people into the world of work on what exactly it is that you state it is, right? So it gave them exposure, um, assisted them to integrate themselves into the world of work. However, it might not have made it attractive for those um, companies in which they were um, doing their tra training in because far many of them did not get absorbed. So how do we get to a point where it is attractive and it is incentivized for big businesses to hire young people? Uh, where is Trudy as he, as he logged off or what's happening? Because I <laughs> think, <laughs> no, no, but I think no, I get you. Get a sense of the progress that has been made with mm. uh, the implementation of the youth employment service. Mr. Dix, are you still on? Okay, whilst, whilst we wait for him, I think because time is also of the essence, um, I'm going to ask a businessman, right? I think, Mr. Zungu, what is it? that could make it attractive for business to hire young people and to give young people the opportunity and not just a short-lived opportunity, but to be able to absorb young people for a far longer period of time. Well, yeah, I don't believe Mr. Zungu is online anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. why, why are people avoiding my question? Can I answer? Please. Please. <laughs> I think I've, I've already mentioned earlier on when I've spoken that the, the role of big business is not really to create employment. Perfect. So a lot of them, when, once they, they do get involved in these programs and getting the funding from CTAS and stuff, and, and, and a lot of, I've seen a lot of companies actually use that as, as revenue. So it's actually included as you know part of, of our income comes from what we get from the sitters. So their interest is not really to create, it's just a matter of ticking the box. And it also becomes an issue of just numbers, right? You will say, you know what, I've trained a thousand young people, but you've trained them on what? 
and 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 that is really the challenge that that we have and that's what i mentioned when i said our government put too much emphasis on big business from for, for providing the solutions and they will not because it's all about efficiency it's all about and a lot of them they're not even gaining a lot of business from from new opportunities that they're doing so it's always about the the growth in income comes from increased in prices if you look at their financial statements it's not necessarily like that they came up with a new program that is likely to actually absorb more young people so i think government has to rethink the the model and it goes back to looking at entrepreneurship and also assisting to creating market creating innovations i mean the role of of the csi are for for example it is basically the r d of our country right and there's a lot of innovation that comes from csi that does not get monetized and it does and sometimes when you look at I've attended a couple of CSIR, um, you know, uh, conferences. Is all the masters and this is and all the PhDs just talking to each other. And and but a lot of what is happening, government should think about how can they take all this amazing knowledge that has come from the CSIR, either get big business to invest in turning them into real products and and companies or bring in young people and get them educate that exposure that they need so that we they can also take that if you think about google google those guys did not necessarily come up with an algorithm or the the, the research on search actually it came from a darpa program which is a, a government um r d program and that's how google got you know was born the same thing with um spacex so we need to start thinking about all these things that we have and we are not taking advantage of that knowledge and making sure that people that can monetize that you know let them so so we can't brag that a lot of the innovation that come from csir has been bought by international um you know uh, companies and stuff that is not okay so that's really what i think rethinking of the way of just going and and throwing money to big business to employ young people they will take them this year if government says we're not going to give you funding next year for CETA, boom they're all gone unfortunately that's just the the way um the the system works right now thank you thank you Lindue. Lindue, you speak about rethinking right you, you speak about rethinking how it is that government prioritizes it's funding how it is that it prioritizes who should be the employer in society. Um, there's a question posed online. Lesoho, I have noted your hand. Um, and the question is about the curriculum that is taught in institutions of higher learning, right? And I'm going to pose this question. This question was initially posed to the Deputy Minister, right? But I'm going to pose it to Khoto Maja, who I know um, as a young person, um, is a young businessman as a, and a social entrepreneur, as he has said. But I know, uh, having known Khoto from various walks of life, I know that Khoto studied law. So how is it that you have integrated what it is that you have studied to what it is that you practice? And where do you believe that the lag is and where the shortfall is in terms of what it is that we are being taught in institutions of higher learning and what it is that this, uh, um, that practice is seeking out of us? Thank you, Khoto. Uh, th thank you very much, Loazi. Um, a complex question, but I will attempt to uh, do justice to it. Look, um, the mismatch or the so-called mismatch between skills um, or knowledge taught at um, post-education level and, I mean, post-metric level and what's required in the labor market is quite real. In a sense that you will not learn, at best you will not learn the culture of corporate, you will not learn certain soft skills that are necessary to navigate the corporate space, for instance. However, outside there, those are actually pro, uh, more principal to even the technical knowledge that we learn in the lecture hall, and they are principal to help us to navigate the space. So part of what, for instance, from our social entrepreneurship perspective, what we are doing right now uh, is to support, uh, and I think DM uh, knows about this program, they are leading this program, it's called Entrepreneurship in Higher Education. So, so, so we are also involved now in putting together uh, programs, training programs for students who are studying, for instance, uh, law, uh, medicine. Just yesterday, we launched at the Sefago Mahato University of Health Sciences, and we are introducing entrepreneurship skills even 
in an area where you wouldn't normally study it. And we are introducing it as a non-core offering from outside, connecting the community, the institution, government, and private sector, and making it possible. It is necessary that uh, students have an idea of what happens both in the labor market and in business uh, once they've graduated. Uh, apparently, our uh, graduate unemployment rate is sitting at just over 9%. And we believe strongly that if the mismatch of the skills that are taught and the reality of the labor market as well as the business environment can be closed, that percentage can also be reduced quite significantly, Wazi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mata. And I'd like to applaud you on your initiative because I also believe that so many young people fail to go into entrepreneurship because Institutions of higher learning teach us the skill, right? They teach you how to be an accountant. They'll teach you how to be a lawyer and how it is to be a doctor, but not how to run the business and not how to monetize your skills. So bravo to you and your team, and please do continue growing. I'm now going to hand over to Mkondi, who's going to post more questions to the panel. Uh, Loazi, I'm sorry if I may interject for a second. I do see that Mr. Zungu is online now if you want to direct your question to him. I'll, I'll hand it over to Mkondi. I think he'll... he'll Interrogation further. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There's a big need for the resident voice of business in some of the answers that we're seeing. Um, but I think maybe what I'll do is um, on the theme of business, a lot of people have a concern, and I'm merging a lot of questions into one as we start to close that the youth are underemployed, employed for a short amount of time, and they are there on an incentive basis. Um, Ms. Lindy Omakari was very passionate about the fact that. The SME solution, uh, the SMEs are the solution out of youth unemployment. Now, um, I'd like to get um, a final thought about what business can do differently starting from tomorrow around addressing um, you know, the rethink, I think, is very clear and it was articulated by Ms. Matla. Um, Mr. Zumo, what is it that we do tomorrow morning as business that's different having had this conversation? Understanding where we are with the youth, and is there anything we can take out of this that would give the youth a better tomorrow? Well, I, I, I wish the answer was affirmative. Uh, I'll be misleading you because, um, like Lindy was said, um, you know the the nature of big business. Uh, when you talk about business in South Africa. The fact that uh, I resort to saying big business is because it, it tends to be big business who is taken seriously. The nature of business is that they're looking for efficiencies, greater efficiencies. Um, unless you create incentives, um, they will not do it voluntarily. Unless you give them things like tax breaks, unless you basically say um your participation in the yes program will count towards your bee certificate you're creating an incentive and it's not an additional commitment by business they will actually take from what will have gone to other elements of the balance scorecard and channel towards yes program um which itself i mean with all due respect has not been a spectacular success um so i'm afraid if you're going to continue to look towards business for a solution, uh, you'll continue to be disappointed. And this trust deficit between business and government, between society and business, between labor and business, uh, will get different. Uh, the solution on a sustainable basis is support SME sector and create a very robust architecture for the growth of SME sector in this country. Um, and you'll actually see some of these things. I mean, it's not like a panacea. It's not like a, 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 that's where the, the key to all the solutions lie. But uh, the, the elasticity in the SME sector to employ jobs, uh, to create jobs, the uh, elastic, elasticity towards um, uh, economic growth is pronounced. I think there's ample evidence. If you just keep it simple, make a simple example. If I, if I run uh, a bakery from my garage at home. I employ my sister, my cousin, and we deliver bread to the neighborhood. Um, if the orders from neighboring schools to supply bread or whatever baked um, doubles, 
I'm most likely going to trade from my employment. Um, until I become big business, where I'll say for every doubling of order, I'll probably employ less and put more machines. Uh, there is nothing benevolent in the SMME sector. It's just the nature of the sector. Until you simply graduate as an economy, um, continue to support SMMEs because they're a path to, to, to greatness. Okay. So, so I, I suppose, so, so for taking much of the time, I suppose the point I'm, I'm saying is we could theorize about solutions, but the practical solution lies in greater support for SMMEs. All right. Uh, I'd like to, before we close up, I've seen a long standing hand from Leseko Masisi. Uh, Lesiko, could I ask you to be short and sharp as we try and get as many contributions in as possible? Uh, all right. Good evening. Um, basically, um, I've been trying to uh, to raise this point, but we never touched upon climate change on this. And climate change is one of the most central um, issues regarding youth and everything. So I found I created a model. I'm going to give it short though. I'm not going to go in depth with it, but this model is basically creating uh, non I mean recyclable goods that are all over the streets, um, uh, creating a demand for that by allowing it to be a method of payment for students to go to school, to go to attend universities. And this will basically, you know, sort out um, you know, trash within our streets and reduce climate change. And it's also in line with our UN Sustainable Development Goals and the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable Development Let, as well. So that's what basically all of it. Uh, I don't want to go too much in depth with it, but our role as a youth will be that, um, yeah, that, that's basically it. Great contribution, critical in the sense that there's value that you're adding to society. You're going to use it as currency to enable some employment. It's great that um, it also does good. I think the question is, there are lots of innovations, lots of programs, lots of secrets that exist within government. I think one of the things is that the red tape that young people face is one of those things that we need to deal with. I'm not sure if there's anybody here um, who can address the red tape problem. I've got people who have been to the NEF. They have accused your organization, Wasim, of being just for buddies in your um, NYDA um, branch in Utata. They have said that the, the, the CIFA won't see them because they have to have proof of registration first and they can't even get the help for the bank account. So I've heard Mr. Sandy Lazoum who say it's the support that we need. I've heard passionate people about SMMEs being a solution. How do we get rid of the red tape in such a way that tomorrow morning there can be different answers to somebody standing somewhere with the business plan asking for help? What I'd like to what I'd like to do, maybe as allied to that question, is maybe to summarize, I think, what the green shoots are that are coming out of this conversation. I think it's very important to note that there's been much data that's been shared, much diagnosed in the problem, but it seems to me that there are some today actions, and perhaps what I'll do is I'll ask the convener of the back chat, or maybe my co-facilitator would like to put someone else on the spot. But it seems that there are secrets that exist within the government sector that people don't know how to take advantage of. I'm hearing about a, a national service, I'm hearing about many projects that Mr. Dix is running outside of Yes for Youth. He has multiple partners. There are things that are happening with Harambe and others, which I don't think I have the time to get to now. But I think point number one is that these all need to be listed. They all need to be advertised. And all of these can be accessed by the youth. I think it's terrible that we always starve in a plague of plenty. There always seems to be more money, more programs, more spaces. I'm standing on the premises of a CETA that incentivizes business in cash to take employees that they need because they are all overworked. And what's more is that they provide them with skills. I think that there's a decoding of that secret required. There are government institutions mentioned by Ms. Blindio Makali, like the CSIR, that have got technologies that can be monetized. There are CETA initiatives 
there are DFIs, there are banks. Um, there are so many things that I think we need to get together tomorrow morning. Let everybody know, coordinate that better. And there are at least thousands of new opportunities that can be taken advantage of tomorrow morning if we can do the few solutions that have already come out. Perhaps the statistician, former statisticians general's problem is beyond us for this evening, but all of these solutions are within our grasp and they can happen as early as tomorrow. So with those words, one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to hand over to my co-facilitator. I think she has a final question and then we'll invite some closing remarks. Okay. Um, I do think you're mistaken. I think you've taken the final question and I will now be handing over um, to the Deputy Minister who has invited us um, to close off this engagement tonight. Um, I'd like to bring us back, however, prior to inviting him to close off the session, I'd like to bring us back to the fact that education was listed. Is that the former Statistician General rejoining? I am on time. Um, I'd like to bring us back to the fact that education was listed as priority number 15. In the list of needs that young people have found themselves urging government to provide, education was listed as number 15. And in your closing off remarks, Deputy Minister, how is it that you aim and how is it that your office aims to address this critical need and bring it up the important scale from number 15 to number one? Okay, thank you. I, I thought you were still continuing there. Look, uh, thank you very much for, for, for the contributions, both from the panelists, uh, who I think gave quite uh, invaluable uh, contributions, which uh, we should be taking up, and I hope that the services seat would be, uh, and together with all the other seaters which are the government agencies, also uh, uh, Deputy Minister Dinai and Polio, and, and a whole range of other people will also be taken. Some of the proposals, suggestions, and interventions that we made. But I want to start where the statistician general that uh, the uh, numbers, the former statistician general. And what those tell us is that as long as we do not address certain historical questions in our country, that the, the racial issues will still remain the dominant issue when it comes to uh, ownership of the economy, when it comes to who participates in the economy, when it comes to who produces, uh, but also who predominantly consumes. And I think once we have not, uh, you know, dealt with those issues, uh, you know, we still would have persistent and structural unemployment, uh, economic exclusion, um, small, medium, macro enterprises by particularly young uh, black Africans, uh, you know, uh, 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 not surviving precisely because, um, you know, the historical issues around the ownership of the economy have essentially not been addressed. Uh, you know, we could say that, uh, you know, that's a legislative issue, that's a policy issue. Um, we could actually run the risk of, uh, you know, flowing into yet another abyss if we do not address, uh, you know, uh, 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 that particular issue. Now, uh, yes, we've got bl a black economic empowerment, broad-based black economic empowerment. We've got various incentives that government has introduced. We've got financial uh, uh, development uh, institutions, uh, funding agencies. We've got the National Youth Development Agency, uh, you know, and all of those. But what is clear is that over the last 27 years, some of these institutions have done uh, as much as scratching uh, the surface. And if we still have the structural issues not addressed, we're not going to be moving, uh, you know, uh, uh, any further. And yes, I agree that some of these interventions need to go all out uh, into the laps of uh, young people so that they're able to take advantage uh, of all of those, uh, you know, and that we need to help 
uh, and intervene in terms of capacity with regards to running businesses, with regards to uh, you know who uh, is skilled and how they skilled, what kind of skills they need, uh, you know, and all of that. Uh, so, 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 so that's important. But also importantly, we have put education as a major priority in our country. If you look at education expenditure over the last three, four years, I mean, in 2018, uh, spending for education more than, uh, uh, you know, uh, doubled, almost tripled. Uh, student funding, for instance, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 increased by more than 50%. Yes, it does not necessarily speak to the continuing work that we're doing in improving the quality of education. But I think that this government has placed education at the center of uh, in our human development program. And I think that if we stick to some of the right things that we've been doing and improve on some of the successful projects that uh, you know we've introduced in terms of education, we should be able uh, to yield massive skills into the uh, economy. Now, we always say that there is a skills mismatch, that business is expecting particular skill sets uh, in order for them to employ uh, uh, you know, people into the uh, labor market. But the reality is that uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, economic history illustrates the fact that both government and the private sector, and particularly the private sector, adjusts in terms of what they need, in terms of skills, uh, but also uh, you know, use that human resource that they have for them to be able to uh, survive. The uh, uh, main reason does not necessarily or cannot necessarily be attributed to skills shortage. I think that the main reason is the fact that over the years we've experimented uh, structural unemployment and that if we do not deal with some of the blockages, I refer to uh, you know uh, ownership, I feel, uh, 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 you know refers to economic, uh, uh, well, loosely referred to as economic inclusion. Uh, you know, but uh, if I was in a different platform, I'd be even using uh, much more stronger words. So those are the things that we really need to be uh, addressing for us to be able to see uh, some progress. Otherwise, we may return. Uh, to the abyss. But otherwise, thank you very much for all of those who participated. Your, contrib your contribution is highly appreciated. And for those who've joined us uh, online, uh, those who've commented, I've been going through some of the comments uh, and proposals and suggestions that people have made. I think that those are invaluable and they should form part, part of the report that we, uh, you know, uh, collectively working together with everybody else should advocate as some of the interventions that are urgently needed for us to resolve the unemployment and skills crisis that we face today. Thank you very much, uh, and co-facilitators. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Um, and I think that to close off this evening's engagement, at the end of the day, the only thing we have and the only resource we have is each other. And therefore, I'd like to challenge um, those who have hosted us today to please share the information of other stakeholders that they have access to. Um, I equally was sent an invite via this very link. So if you are in this virtual room, it means that they have contact to you. And I'd like to challenge those who have invited us here today to give us information in terms of whose email addresses we can talk to, whatever resource that it is that we need. Am I right, Mkondisi? It's absolutely the case that when we started off, we started on a very somber note. And um, I thank the Deputy Minister for acknowledging the gift of the comments on all the spheres because they are incredibly useful in directing all of us as to what we need to do tomorrow. Um, I am hoping that the information that we spoke about, the best kept secrets, that they come out as soon as we're done here and that tomorrow ushers in a brighter day where we can build on some of the green shoots that we can see. Hopefully we can abandon the things that are not working and then we can have a different conversation about this um, state of affairs in the shortest time possible. And um, for that, I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Minister Budimana Mela for convening this discussion and for everyone who's participated, for everyone at home who gave us the difficult task of trying to coordinate 5,000 comments and formulate them into coherent questions for our expert panels. We appreciate it. And don't let the conversation die down. Keep it going. 
um, visit the minister's page, see some updates, and we hope to see you again for the next back chat um, when it's announced on social media. Have a great evening. Thank you.